Hello, everybody. Welcome. Let's just give another minute for people to come on in. We have a couple of people in the waiting room. We'll just wait another minute for any stragglers. Hey, Sandy, Deborah. I don't see other faces. Everybody, you can go on video. We can all see your happy faces. You don't have to, but. All right, it's 7.01 my time. So I'm gonna get started and introduce Mary Jo. So, uh, so welcome to uh, the latest lecture for the American Journal of Sexuality Education Lecture Series. My name is Bill uh, and I've been organizing these sessions and I am delighted to introduce a very good friend of mine, our speaker, Dr. Mary Jo Pajerski, uh, who, is, uh, who runs the Teen Outreach Center in Washington, the conservative community of Washington, Pennsylvania, um, uh, and uh, is the author of, is it 13 Nani books now? It's, it's, a, it's 10 Nani books and one to go, but I have, I have 36 books in general. 36 books in general. Okay, yes, but sir. I was gonna talk about the Nani series. These the are Nani series. Um, uh, books for, uh, for helping children um, discuss difficult to talk about topics. So there's, um, uh, there's a book on Nani talks about puberty and Nani talks about gender and Nani talks about uh, consent and Nani talks about race. In fact, is that still available? Like you were giving that, a, you gave away well, a whole bunch of- Well, it starts on Juneteenth. I did, Nani talks about quarantine in about, in 10 days, literally in 10 days. And I gave it away. I started giving it away on April 5th and I stopped on June 5th when our city went green. So I gave over 500 PDF copies of Nani talks about quarantine away as a download. Wow. But I'm so giving nice. away Nani talks about race just for one day on Friday for Juneteenth. Ooh, okay. Hopefully um, we have a, a link for that that I can share in the chat. And if not, um, I'll send it out to folks afterward. Yeah, you're probably uh, going to have to wait. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Uh, that's fine. If people don't mind getting an email, like you get a lot of email from me, I know. Um, but we're here tonight to talk about uh, Sex Ed is in Session, Mary Jo's brand new book. So excited to have you talk about <laughs> that maybe read a little bit from it and uh, and then have a great discussion about sex education. So I'm really excited. And Mary Jo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's so good to see some of your faces. And even if I don't see your faces, I know most of your names. I'm currently running, I'm currently running um, eight virtual summer camps that I'm offering for free for 12 to 14 year olds. And some of the kids start out like this, like you see the very top of their heads only. And then by the end of the camp, they don't want to end. We're having such a good time. But I become a Zoom master as a result of that. So I, I will begin by telling you that this will not be a lecture. It will be a conversation, if you're willing to do that. Um, and I'm happy to share my experience. I've been in the field a while. I taught my first sex ed in 1981. I don't know, Deborah, we're probably close. What year did you start? It was around there, probably a little earlier 71. than me, maybe. I'm sorry? 71. Ah, oh, amazing. Well, I just finished nursing school in 71, but the bottom line is it's been a while, right? We've been in the fields a long time. So um, the first thing I always do is set guidelines. I've been doing this since the beginning. I, uh, I taught childbirth education from 75 through... 2012. So no matter what I've ever taught, I have always started with guidelines and you all know that. But my primary thing I want to share with you is you will all be respected by me. From my heart, I believe each person is a person of worth. That's one of my foundational statements. So you are each worthy. And to me, worthiness is something you don't have to earn. It's just part of who you are. So I am raising, um, I raised three children, but I'm raising half the community's kids, I swear. I run a teen center and it's incredibly active. And these, these summer camps I'm doing, eight of them, we're seeing between 60 and 70, 12 to 14 year olds a day. They start at 10, they end at six and it's fun. It's a little wild, but it's fun. So I, I was very interested in spending time with you mostly because at my age, uh, I, I turned 70 in March, and at my position in life, I'm a breast cancer survivor, I hope, 
it's hard to know at this point. Um, I had a big surgery in, in January 19 and then started chemo in March of 19 and finished in March of 20, but then had to have something else in May. So I, I'm hoping that I am fine, but if I'm not, I'm gonna be okay. But that's why my hair is white. It all came back after chemo as white, but I think that's what it was. I had been coloring it for a very long time. And one of the sixth grade boys that I see privately in counseling sessions um, cannot understand why it's not brown. He says to me on a regular basis, when I Zoom with him, your hair should be brown, sweetie. It's always been white for 20 years. Why didn't it come in brown? Because it hasn't been brown for a long time. He can't wrap his head around that phenomenon. So those of you who haven't seen me for a while, this is my new hair and I'm happy to have it because I did not do well as a bald person. The only meme I meant, I made, I made a meme of a Egyptian queen with a magnificent bald head and a beautiful crown. And I put on the top of it what I thought I would look like during chemo. And then I got a picture of Charlie Brown and I put on the bottom uh, what I really look like during chemo. So I was not one of those bald headed individuals who could put gems in their head. I was just like, not so good. So let's start off aside from the guideline that I've shared with you that you are all worthy in my heart. Um, let's start off with a little bit from the book and then let's talk about sexuality education and where it's going. Bill alluded to something very powerful and that is that I do teach in a very conservative community. And I still don't know how I've been able to do this. We've taught a quarter million teens from 88 to 2013, and then we stopped counting. No, we still can't count. But that's how many we taught, my staff and I, in 48 schools in five counties. Um, and I started every one of those damn schools. I went to every one of those school boards. I went to one school board seven times before they took us. I am persistent as all get out. So it was not easy. Um, and I've been attacked twice pretty publicly, but I survived both attacks. I started the first GSA in my county in 2005 and started one in an adjoining county, and that was even harder, in um, 2018. So we live in a in, um, very, we have a tiny pockets of blue and a sea of red in the counties that I live in and that surround me. So pretty conservative, and yet we've made some nice, nice steps forward. So let me stop. Anybody have any thoughts before I go any further? Because I'm here to listen. Okay. I teach my peer educators who I teach with them all the time, or they teach with me, but lately I think it's them teaching and I'm helping. I teach them to wait 15 seconds after they say, do you have any questions? And I have some that are very literal about that. I can see their lips going. Somebody said, how did I present to the school boards and convince them? Oh, I have, I talk about that in the book, but I will be happy to tell you that. First of all, I'm Italian, so I feed people. And the first thing I do before I'm going to a school board is find somebody that might respond to having lunch with me. That's step one. And the way I do that is I haunt um, anything I can find about school board. I look at minutes in the school board and newspapers. When I started this, it was no social media. And so I would see who voted, how they voted. And if somebody voted to put music back in the school, if it was taken out, I would find that person and find their phone number and I would call them. And I would say, hi, I'm Mary Jo Pekersky and I direct the teen outreach and I would love to have lunch with you. And so when I, by the time I got to a school board meeting, I had at least two faces there that I knew and who knew me and I knew were allies. Sometimes I had four if I was really lucky. But I wasn't always received well. I just was persistent. Um, one school, I will never forget, it was 1993. And I came to the board meeting prepared for it to be tough. And the school nurse came to the board meeting unbeknownst to me. I didn't know she was against this. And she told me that I was not professional because I allowed teenagers, I hate that word really, I, I say young people, I allowed teenagers to say disgusting words and that, that I should never, no one should teach reproduction, which is the only thing she thought of as sex ed, with those disgusting words. So I left when they deliberated. 
um, and it was unanimous. They took me, but I followed her out into the hall. And I, I had done my homework, by the way, I had five people on that board who I had had lunch with, individually, but I had lunch with them. So I followed around the hall and I said, I respect your words, but I don't understand them. You're a nurse. What are the disgusting words? She said, oh, you let them say penis and vagina and, and other things. I said, oh, like clitoris? She went, oh, yes. I said, well, tell me how you would teach. She said, I would say male reproductive organ and female reproductive organ. I said, explain some kind of a sexual experience for me. She said, there's only one sexual experience and that's the kind that makes babies. And you pronounce it like this. You say, the male reproductive organ goes into the female reproductive only as long as it needs to be there to make a baby. And I went, I'm also a sexuality counselor. If you ever wanna come over, I'm, I'm open. How sad is that, right? This woman was probably 50 something. And I thought, what kind of sex life have you had? If that's what you think, you just keep it in there long enough to have a baby, dear God help me. But the bottom line is she was one of my most vocal opponents. Um, so here's what I will tell you from my experience, and it's just my experience, remember that. Um, it helps to be known. In my community, I'm very known. I was a Girl Scout leader for 13 years. I taught childbirth at one time, four times a week. So anybody had a baby between 1975 and 2012 or whatever knew me. Um, when I went to my first high school, they had 1400 kids in that school. And I called, I did a cold call, which nobody would let you do now. But it was 1988 and they gave me this pile of phone numbers and I picked it up and I called all these parents and they said the same thing over and over. Are you the lady who I had birth classes with? Are you the lady who had my kid in Girl Scouts? Are you the lady? And they, they didn't care. So trust is everything. So it was much harder when I went to other counties. That's why I went to one place seven times. I had to wait for the board to change. But I kept calling, hi, remember me? I'd like to come and address your board. So I hope that helps. Anything else? Because I'm ready to answer anything. All right, I'm going to read one piece from the book that I think might be helpful for our topic tonight. It's called Where Our Cultural Fear of Sexuality Begins. I own a set of 1905 sex ed books where the word pleasure is absent, and masturbation is referred to as self-pollution. There are two companion volumes, one for young women of 15 years and up and one for young men of 15 years and up. And obviously gender is binary in 1905. Of course, it's binary sometimes in my community, so what can I tell you? But this was 1905. The book for young women never mentions masturbation, nor does it even explain conception. It doesn't talk about menstruation, but it does have some interesting pearls of wisdom. Did you know that hanging clothes on a line to dry removes a backache? or that washing dishes eases headaches. Again, no sex, not even periods, are discussed in this book that is entitled, What a Young Woman Needs to Know About Sex. What a young, young Man Needs to Know About Sex does a similar review of plant biology. It talks about wheat, barley, and corn, and how they reproduce. There are three chapters, however, three whole chapters, mind you, devoted to the great and horrible sin of self-pollution. Young men are chastised to avoid touching their quote-unquote male parts during their weekly bath. Mm. They are instructed to wash their bodies and vigorously splash cold water upon these parts and let them air dry to avoid stimulation. They were also admonished to abstain from sliding down banisters for the same reason. Lest these young men ignore the prohibitions, the authors added several pages about the consequences of the dreaded act of self-pollution. Would they go blind, get hairy palms, or go insane? No, their fate was far more final. The book clearly states that self-pollution will result in death. The young men were told they will not be able to predict which act of self-pollution will be fatal. I picture boys in 1905 clutching their Sears robot catalog underwear sections, deciding if pleasure was worth the risk. And then I talk about Kellogg and Graham, but that when I wrote that, I almost put in that one of the things I get a lot from parents, even today, are when their little boys are interested in the underwear section of little boys. And they come to me and say, why does he want to look at this? And I say, well, let's talk. Ma so Mary I Jo, 
I'm sorry to interrupt, but no, okay. do, do, you mind, do you mind elaborate? I, I'm not sure that everybody knows about Kellogg and Graham. Do you mind saying oh, a little bit more? I, okay, of course. I love, I teach a class at WNJ, it's a human sexuality class. I also teach Ed Sykes. So if you want to talk about theorists, I got you, except that I don't teach old dead white men theorists. I teach Crenshaw and Bell, and I talk about all the other things that people don't talk about. And I throw in Piaget and Erickson like tidbits. So, yeah, so Kellogg and Graham at the turn of the century, when these books in 1905 were written, believed that masturbation was horrible, and they thought the whole grains would prevent it. Now, this was really directed, in my experience and what I've read, uh, people didn't think much about woman masturbating, although they did do some critterectomies in some places in our country, but mostly they were worried about young men. They weren't interested in female pleasure for the most part. Um, but Kellogg thought that cornflakes, that's why they made cornflakes, and that's why Graham made Graham crackers, because you were supposed to ingest this grain, and it was supposed to take away your sexual, whatever, urges, feelings, um, self. <laughs> it's supposed to take away yourself. It staggers my mind. I got a call this afternoon, this afternoon in 2020, from an irate woman who was just beside herself because her daughter lost her virginity and she wants to sue the, f the, the young person she had this experience with. And I, I talked her down from the cliff and talked about virginity being a nebulous situation and finally got her to admit her early sexual experiences were pretty grim. It was an hour call, but it was worth it. But she was ready to call an attorney. So, some things haven't changed. I need to put glasses on so I can look in the chat. Oh my, my grandmother had that book inherited from her mother. It was crazy to read. It is crazy to read. Um, my mom wasn't that much better though. I mean, my mother actually, I talk about this in the book, she had me using rags instead of pads. You know how you talk about on the rag for menstruation? That was me. I bought my first sanitary napkins at my 11th birthday because I started my periods at 10 with my own money for my birthday. My dad was, my papa was my conspirator. He helped me buy them. But she put them, she made me pin them to my underwear. It's probably TMI, but they're tough people. And then she boiled them in Clorox water and cooked them in the basement. So I still, the smell of Clorox to this day makes me go, oh my. Very embarrassing experience. But that's what they were told. It was, that's what they were told. So somebody asked me, um, oh, my grandma taught me to add a spoonful of sugar to my cornflakes. Oh, that's awesome. She probably likes sugar. I just like sugar. I have a question. I work with college students. Any advice? We are struggling with dating apps and encouraging positive sexuality. I work with college people too, and they think they're old. And no offense to anyone who's in college who's here right now, but um, they're, they're, unless they've had some decent sexuality education, they probably didn't get any at home. And when I say decent, I, I'm not expecting us to, to cover everything. I get in trouble when I cover gender, I cover it anyway. Um, there are schools where they say we're not supposed to talk about LGBTQ stuff and I say, you hired me, I'm here, I have a contract. My contract states that I will talk about what I think is important for sexuality education for young people, you have the right to remove your students, but you don't have the right to tell me what to say. And that's what I do. Um, but what's hard for my college young people, because I teach at WNJ College, which is a particularly privileged school. And there's a lot of kids who came from really lovely families, but had no conversation for whatever reason. And so, I find the biggest problem I run into is, is um, what happens on a date that's not consensual. I mean, rape is, is real. And um, this is going to uh, my opinion hat. Those of you who know me, I have an opinion hat. I put it on when I have an opinion. And here's my opinion that Cedar Falls is just damaging, damaging people with the changes they're making about sexual assault. And it's going to be much tougher for a young person of any type to talk about sexual assault on campus anymore. It's bad enough as it is. So um, dating apps, I, I don't know much about, but I do have college age peer educators who run that test, those classes for me, because I'm, I'm too old for dating apps at this point. I do have um, 
some success with that. So I have 20 year olds teaching 20 year olds. In my peer education program, I have seven to 18 year olds teaching 14 and 15 year olds and 14 and 15 year olds teaching 12 and 13 year olds. I keep the gap pretty close. Um, so I don't know if that helps. Let me see if I, if I covered it okay. Yeah. yeah, this person is in an office without resources. Um, encouraging positive sexuality, my key, if I would say my secret ingredient is peer education. Somebody asked me earlier, how do you keep sexuality going in our current times? You teach people and you step back. Thanks, Bill. He just put the link for my sex ed in session book. So I don't need to be in a classroom for the classroom to, to excel. And I firmly believe in teaching, homogeneous teaching is very important. So I want, I, my staff has always been 40% non-white. That's purposeful. I did that in 1988, I've never changed. And I don't have to worry about that because there are quality people out there, it's easy. But my teens who teach with me are incredibly diverse in terms of their race and their sexuality and ethnicity and their ability, one of my best, best peer educators and she's graduating. I'm very sad about losing her. She was my consulting author for Nani Talks About Disability. She has spent her life um, using a wheelchair because she was born with a very difficult, difficult congenital challenge. And she's sharp as a whip. She's going to my college next year. And so when I teach with peer educators, their very presence, the fact that they are there teaches. So if I, if I have a classroom of kids that are homogeneous and don't know anything about anything except their own privilege, and I bring in this little team of kids who are so open to each other. One of my young men said to me the other day, I don't understand why the country can't be like us. And I said, I, I didn't teach the country, but I taught you and you're great. So if I were in charge of college, and I didn't have any way to bring in sex positivity, I would train peer educators. That's my niche. Somebody says, I believe in that. Yes. Oh, that's beautiful. I believe in that theory. I teach my daughters, so at the very least, they are the most accurately informed persons in their tier group, teen group. I use the same practice at the library where I have my sex ed programs. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's hard when you're raising children. My kids are 34. Um, 39 and almost 44, so they're not children anymore, but they, they really did make my life hard when they were teens. I mean, I brought, everybody got condoms when they were 12. I put them in their sock drawers and I said, so um, if you need these, here they are. And I taught them how to use them. And when I came home from work one day and my 13 year old son and six of his buddies had made water balloons and they were playing in the backyard, having a good time. Um, yeah. And I was called the sex lady. Many of you are called the sex person. And I thought he wouldn't want me to teach. I talk about this in my book. I thought he would want somebody on my team to teach his class. But he said he wanted to be the SLS, the sex lady's son. And he was quite good at it. He brought me all kinds of people. My mom did the same thing and I went into public health. God bless. Yeah. I have always saw sexuality as part of life and part of who I am and part of who the people I love are and part of who the teens that I serve are. So I'll tell you a quick story about um, individuals. I believe in acceptance, not tolerance. So I've worked about 13 years now with the ARC, which serves people of all types, but um, I have a book called, a program called Inside Out about child abuse prevention. And about nine years ago, I decided I would write one for adults in facilities like group homes because they're at such high risk. But I didn't want to do it myself. Just like I had Kendall, the young peer educator, help me with Nani Talks About Disability, and I had Marietta Gary Smith and Tanya Bass help me with Nani Talks About Race because I have white privilege and I couldn't speak to that. So I wanted self-advocates to help me write this book. So I do this with them over the course of nine months. It's a 52-page book. We did one book, a, one page a day. Yeah, one page a day. And after the first couple sessions, I had them set their own guidelines. And they took turns. And so it was funny because there was one gentleman who was probably in his mid thirties at the time. 
Um, and he has a lot of interesting issues in his life, but he's incredibly strong. And every time he did guidelines, he would do the traditional ones. We're going to have confidentiality. We're going to respect each other. And then he would get this grin on his face and he would go, also, no one may fart. <laughs> and the kids would go, the people would go, you're right. We won't do that. You're right. Giving other people a voice is the foundation of what I've done. So has that backfired? Oh, sure. My young people do plays with me. We write one every year. It's a wonderful way to teach. And one year, so how many years ago, the kids that were in this are in their 30s, but it was called Lunch Table. And it was a conversation that happened at a lunch table. And after we write this, we write it together, I give it to them to make the language real. And so I went on a trip and came back. And the day I came back, we went to a middle school to teach. So I have high school people, let me picture this, doing teaching with me in a middle school. And we walk in to teach. And the teacher who I'm there for is a little conservative. That's my community. But he always liked me. I taught him when he had his kids. So he was OK with me. Um, and we left. And I thought nothing of it. But what I didn't realize is one of the boys in our performer group had left a script at his, at his teacher's room when we left. We come back the next day to do the second class, and he meets me at the door, and he is beyond livid. Because what I didn't know is they had changed the dialogue, but the very, very first word in the play was fuck. This man lost his, I don't know, sense of equilibrium. And he was on me about this word. And I finally said, when he stopped her yelling, I said, it just means sex. You know, take a deep breath. He said, there are some words no one says in my class. Words that hurt people, the N word, the F word that has to do with being gay, the R word that has to do with having different intellectual and developmental abilities. Those words are never said, but this just means sex. And he thought, he told me boldly that it was much worse than those other three words, after which time I went to the principal and said, I will not be teaching in his class anymore. I don't belong to the school. So I can do that. But it was hard because he was mean. What compensation opens for pre-educations have been successful? I pay them, but never when they're um, just gathering. I pay them when they teach. Um, I pay them their last of the, they, they do 12 hours of instruction and I pay them the last two hours just because I want to make sure they're committed to this. And then every time they teach, they get paid and they get paid $10 an hour. The supervisors get 12 and 14. So when you get to be upwards of 17 and 18, you get more money. Hope that answers your question. What do you think, Bill? How are we doing time-wise? Well, we're at, <clears throat> we have a soft stop at 7.30. Yep. We can go a little bit over. Um, I just want about two minutes at the very end to just give everybody updates about what we're doing next and future sessions and some links and stuff like that. Well, so, it's 728, so maybe we should be done. Okay. I, was, well, I, I can talk about stuff for days. You know I can. Does anybody want to come off mute and ask a question or make a comment? Do we cover everything in the chat? We did. I read it and covered it. The one thing we didn't talk about that I, I would like to talk about is in, in a little more detail is the future. Thank you. It's mostly about my papa too. My father was my primary influence. Somebody had said they were going to buy the book. Um, one of the things that I believe with all my heart is that the future is in our young people's hands. Not I'm too old. That doesn't mean I'm not going to teach them and train them and, and supervise them and mentor them. I have a lot of faith in the future. Not because of me. Because our kids are awesome. They get it. They get it so much. We had a Black Lives Matter in my little town. My little town, we had 400 people attend it. And every single one of the organizers were my peer educators, only they were older. They were 27 and 22 and 19. They were all my kids, except they were old now. And all of my peer educators went, every single one of them. And I cried. I had to watch the video because I was, I'm still social distancing because of the chemo, but I sat there watching this video with tears running down my cheeks and texting these kids. I can't believe you say, oh, you're so grown up. And he's writing back in the middle of this thing. 
I'm only 19, don't make me feel so old. It was, here's what, what I need you to leave with. Everything in my book is from my heart, but everything I teach is from my heart. And I don't think you reach kids unless you connect at that level. So when I hire somebody, the one of the first things I say during the interview process is you will be given young people to mentor, either educationally or counseling wise, and you will give them your personal cell number and you will not turn it off because you'll be connected 24 seven with those kids and you'll set boundaries. And I explain how to do that and I model how to do that, but I have been on call 24 seven since 1988 and I don't ignore a call. I took a call in recovery from a bilateral mastectomy and my husband took the phone from me and said, honey, you're not making much sense. <laughs> I was still high from the drugs. And I said to him, tell them I'll call them back when I'm not high. And I did. So if you, if you lived in my community and I hired you, that's my criteria. I don't want halfway because kids don't need you from nine to five. They need you at three o'clock in the morning. Right? Right. When that went fast, let me put my email in here. Can I do that, Bill? Yes, absolutely. And Hi. I'll hold up your book again and oh, uh, tell people are. Sex Ed is in Session is the title of the book. And look for, uh, I'll, I'll be happy to send an email um, uh, note to folks once you have the information about, uh, about the free download for Juneteenth. Yeah. Um, of We're not going to kick it off until race. Friday morning. Sorry to interrupt you, but we're yep. not kicking it off till Friday morning. Um, yeah, yeah. Let me know, and I'll, I'll be happy you. to share that information. So um, that's my email. Email me, Mary Jo. Thank you so much for thank this you. presentation, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Next week's session is going to be. Um, uh, it's a it, it's a repeated session, one at six and one at seven. It's perceived sex education and its association with consent attitudes, intention, uh, intentions and communication with Kaylee Richmond and Zoe Peterson. And so that is next week. The other thing that folks should know about is um, uh, that uh, uh, beginning in July, we are going to, uh, it pains me to say this, I'm really sorry for this, but we're going to need to begin charging for these sessions. Uh, I feel very strongly about wanting to be able to pay an honorarium for speakers. And, uh, and also I feel very strongly about covering my Zoom expenses <laughs> and other expenses that are beginning to pile up a little bit. So, um, so I'm gonna share the, the link for signups for July, but I'm also going to share the, the the discount link uh, and the scholarship sign up link because I don't want um, uh, this to stop anybody who wants to come from actually attending and I'm gonna you know as long as space permits I'm gonna give out as many scholarships as uh, uh, as I can uh, and discounts and such so that people if, if the twenty five dollar fee is not affordable I want people to still be able to come so those links are now in the chat and the first speaker in July is uh, Debbie Rothman, uh, the author of Talk to Me First, and she's going to be uh, speaking about creating authentic partnerships with parents around human sexuality education. So thank you again uh, for joining us tonight, and uh, Mary Jo, thank you again. And My pleasure. Wishing you all good health and uh, uh, hopefully getting out and doing something fun uh, as soon as it's safe to do so. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thanks. Bye -bye. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.